So today on Face to Face, we are interviewing amazing hairstylist Harry Josh. He's also one of the most soulful people you'll ever meet. So I really hope you enjoy the talk. I, do, I didn't do well in school. Um, I was obsessed with fashion magazines. My parents absolutely insisted I go to college. Um, I didn't want to go, and then on my graduation day, my parents literally just said to me, we've already enrolled you. The first day of college, collected all my books, went to college, and met another girl in the back of the class who also didn't want to be there, and so we skipped. We'd always loiter outside this very cool fashion hair salon. So we'd hang outside this salon and smoke cigarettes every day. We'd skip school every single day. I never went to college once. About a week or two later, the manager of the salon comes out. He goes, you guys are always out here. What are you doing? We're like, really? We're just skipping school. You know, we just love watching you guys work. He's like, why don't you come in and be hairdressers? My friend immediately <laughs> is like, I don't want to do hair. And I'm like, I do, but I don't know anything about hair. And they're like, oh, well, we have an internship program here, which means you learn on the job. And this was like a paid internship. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> so I got my first semester done. But at this point, the three months had passed of me learning how to do hair that the owner was like, listen, I'm going to put you on the floor early as a junior stylist. All you'll be doing is doing basic cuts, trims, right. one length things, nothing crazy. And you'll be a lower price than everyone else. But we believe you're ready to start taking people. I started you know, being very busy very quickly. And I felt like it was time to tell my parents that I'm like, listen, I'm this whole time I haven't been going to college. And How did that I, go? It went terribly. My dad's like, oh my God, you're gonna be a barber. My son is gonna be a barber. I'm like, dad, it's not a barber, it's a hairstylist. And like, <laughs> we do really cool things. And they just didn't see it as that. As I'm working in the salon, my hunger didn't satisfy there because I remember seeing an outtake of a behind the scenes image of a, a shot. And I wanna say, for the memory's sake, it's Cindy Crawford standing on a cliff. And I wanna say it's Serge brushing her hair on the Amalfi Coast. It's like a behind the scenes shot. And I thought, I'm like, I don't even need to wait for a visa. I'm gonna go to the States and the minute they see me, I'm gonna get an agency. It's 1991, January of 91, and we're like, hey, we're going to South Beach. South Beach is the new Mecca. I'm gonna go get discovered. <laughs> I am so talented and crafted and I have been able, literally this was my thinking. So I worked with a bunch of people in South Beach for a year. Forget Miami, I'm ready to go to New York. And same thing happened. I met all the agencies, rejection, 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 rejection. This is New York, this is the big dogs, your book is terrible, you need to be an assistant. So I'm like, oh God. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> fine, then I'll assist. So then I bobbed around assisting. So I kind of gave up on the dream. I'm like, you know what, I'm just gonna go back to the hair salon. I get to the salon, they're like, you can't be on the floor, you need to be an assistant here. What, I'm so used to this, I'm like, fine, assisting it is. <laughs> so I washed hair and blow dried hair. Here comes a little kicker. Back then, Julie Mannion, the then president of KCD Worldwide, used to come in for her hair all the time. So what ended up happening is the assistants would rotate at the salon as to who got to blow dry who. But I didn't want the tip because I realized when I blow dried her hair, she had all these binders in her lap and on each subheading was like Ralph Lauren, Polo, Marc Jacobs, Anna Sui, you know? And I'm like, what do you do? I asked her and she goes, I'm a fashion producer. And I'm like, what's that? Like I was naive, I didn't understand what a fashion producer even. She's like, well, I produce fashion shows around the world. I help put together the lighting, the stage, the audience, the venue, all that stuff. And I'm like, wow. Like that first spark of excitement came back the same way it did when I was 18. I'm like, another way into the fashion industry. Everyone would say she comes back every four weeks for her hair. So at this point, everybody wanted the tip because she was a very generous tipper. I'm like, I will give you the tip. Let me blow dry her hair. Mm. Let me just get in her hair, head. You know what I mean? That um, I bug her, I bug her, I bug her. So anyway, she finally feels bad for me. She goes, call Nyan Fish, who is the vice president at the time. She goes, call her and she'll set you up with something to do. So I'm sitting in a closet of this room. The door is shut. I'm in like a small closet from here to the window. And it's just me on the floor sitting cross-legged with a thousand cards on the floor. And I'm there for eight hours, just quietly like, you know, A is for Aileen. Uh, a is for Adina, B is for Betsy, C is for Kathy, all the way down. And as I'm doing that, I'm studying all the girls and I'm having the time of my life. I'm like, wow, I'm looking at <laughs> professional model cards. Kate Moss, women agency, 5'8". Oh, I thought she was 5'7". You know, like I'm like studying all this information, their hip, their bust, their waist, their dress size. And I'm like so into it because I'm like, wow, this is, I'm feeling like that spark has come back. I'm finally back in the industry, you know, in a different way, but yeah. I'm back. The second or third day, the books are all, the books still need to be correlated, but they're like, now we have to fix ourselves, so we're gonna actually ask you guys to sit on the floor of the main room where we're having the creative meetings. I couldn't even sleep the night before, because I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna be in the same room as <laughs> these creative people while I'm sitting on the floor. And of course, we're sitting on the floor, cross-legged, just doing our work, uh, and told not to pay attention to what's going on behind me. That's all I'm listening to is everything they're saying behind me about whatever. And I don't even remember the full reference, but all I remember is some editor 
maybe even Brana, I don't even remember, having a cigarette, looking at the window, kind of just giving an idea. And being like, I wanted to feel like, she pulls out a reference in her mind being like, how when Linda eventually used to cut her hair short and she was wearing the purple sweater on the, that August cover of Elle. And out of nowhere, I'm on the floor listening to this whole dialogue. I'm like, it was July and it was orange. Because <laughs> I knew that she was wrong. And there was a beat in the room of dead silence where like, who just spoke? One of the other guys, John Pfeiffer, mm -hmm. uh, who's one of the cast directors, he goes, actually, he's right. So then they became instantly nice to me. You're, you're one of us, like you're a fashion. You can get off the floor. Yeah, you're a fashion <laughs> victim. You're obsessed with all these things just as much as we are. Where do you want to be in this world? And I just said, I go, casting. Because that would bring me close to the models, which is all I ever really wanted, was to be around models. I was working as a casting director six months a year and only doing hair out of my apartment to make money during those off months. And then at the time, I had met an unknown Giselle. She'd come onto the scene, but I'm like, wow, she's such a cool girl. We became really good friends. And she would complain about how her hair had gotten so much darker since she'd been modeling, because she's not on the beach anymore. She was like, I used to get these light bits that would just come around my face and around the ends, and you know. And I'm like, I can do that. And so it became known that Harry, the casting guy, does hair too. Amy Astley, who was the beauty director of Vogue, was shopping at Yves Saint Laurent, happens to mention to a girl, I love your hair color. Thank you, Harry Josh does that. Another model shopping independently, turns her head around the corner and goes, he does my hair color too. The sales guy who's assisting <laughs> Amy goes, he cuts my hair. And she goes, whoa, 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 how am I the beauty director of Vogue and I don't know who Harry Josh is. And, she, and he writes down on a piece of paper, he does Giselle and Carolyn Krakova out of her, out of his apartment, call him. So then I get a phone call that day from Amy Astley's office. I'll never forget the voicemail. Uh, and it was just like, hi, we're calling from the office of Amy Astley. She's doing a feature on five up and coming hairdressers. She'd like to speak to Harry Josh. Of course, I didn't, she, they didn't even say Vogue. When they said Amy Astley, like I said, I'd memorized the masthead. I knew who that was. Right. I played that message to every person who walked in the door <laughs> for the next six hours. I'm like, do you know who just left a message for me? So, anyways, but also, you are still, your job title is still casting. I have nothing to do with hair. Right. So there's no hair connection whatsoever. I'm That's not working so at a salon, I'm not doing hair. I'm known as a casting person in the industry. No one knows me as hair. So she walks up my sixth floor walk up, huffs and puffs, she's pregnant, she's furious that no one had told her it was a walk up. <laughs> Super frustrated. She comes in, I tell her the whole spiel that I just finished telling you but had some pictures to document along the way. She could not believe the journey I had had and the relationships that I had built with this girl being at such a disconnected, lower assistant type level. The article comes out in the March 2002 issue of Vogue. It was supposed to be an article on five up and coming hairdressers to look out for. It turned into a full page feature of me, full page of my face. That same afternoon the article launched, the agencies called me. Do you have representation? Do you want an agency? Wow. The same ones that I had met multiple times that are like, you will never be anything. <laughs> Once you were blessed by Vogue, it just changed everything. Within two days, my first booking was Harper's Bazaar with Patrick de Marchelier. Wow. Uh, Mary Alice was the editor. So he got me my first editorial right out of the gate. So I didn't have time to work my way up. It just hit. You've been doing hair in your, in your place, you've been cutting and doing that, but maybe not necessarily, I'm guessing, yeah. not necessarily like nothing. the do's and the... Nothing. So I was so green when this hit. I hadn't really been honing my skills in a long time. My first few years were kind of bad. Right. I was given all these opportunities and I lost them all because they're like, oh, that was not the best day with that guy. Right. You know what I mean? So I basically told my agency, I'm like, you need to stop. I need to reset. I'm like, I'm not ready for these big jobs that are coming to me. Let me get well versed. Serge took me back under his wing and he's like, let me get you to a position where you feel more comfortable. So I was friendly with him and he just said, like, listen, this is, if you want that curl to last all day, you need to put this in it. Right. This because is Serge Normand. We're talking Serge Normand. Yeah. If you want that to, you know, in humidity, how that's gonna stay, you're gonna have to put this in this. So I built myself up from the bottom again, started doing smaller magazines, started working my way back up. I would like to talk to you about, obviously you have your own um, line of um, tools. tools. Yeah. Why, why did this start? What was the sort of impetus to this whole thing? So it's really smart if you come into this industry to feel like you have at least one foot of an exit strategy um, because you, know, you can't be hip or cool or hot forever. There's always going to be the next generation who's going to replace the next generation. We're, uh, it's an ephemeral industry. So for me, it was really important to um, have something that A, I felt served a purpose. Everything in my life is about, without sounding crazy, of service. When you come from a place of service, your reward is always going to be much higher. I definitely wanted to do a luxury tool line that was not manufactured in any way 
that would, someone along the food chain would not be paid uh, fairly, that people will save up their money, invest in something good. Our dryers are hand assembled in France. So there's very, if not n no dryers, on the marketplace that are hand assembled by France. What does that mean to the consumer? What are you getting out of that? What's my advantage? Well, your advantage is this. You're getting a superior crafted uh, device or machine that's not only gonna create great performance for your hair and give you a good result, but also knowing that whatever you've put that money into, no one is, there's no CEO driving around in like a Porsche because of what you purchased in. Literally, I have senior ladies, I've got footage of this in my factory, uh, in, this, in this countryside of France, and they have little bandanas on, and they literally sit there and they screw the nuts and bolts. We don't have a big factory where things are machinely compiled. We don't have a conveyor belt of a thousand workers. There's craftsmanship in a way that uh, not only serves the employees who are putting the love and attention into the product that they're making, but also the end result in making less mistakes and less errors for how the cables and the electricals are all put together. I'm not taking those jobs from those workers who still deserve a fair salary, going to a cheaper factory in a different country so that I can get profits. I'm able to employ them and say, you get your summers off. In August, we don't produce dryers. Right. Because in France, the law is nobody in factories works. So I honor that. I'm like, okay, we have a shipment of dryers in September. The customers are gonna have to wait till October because these ladies need their break in August and I wanna honor that. Do you think, have, have you always been like this? And has it been sort of easy to, has it been something that you had to sort of keep to yourself for a long time and people are now catching up? I had my first awakening when I saw you was 21. I read a book that really uh, shifted my consciousness and really stuck with me. And from there, I've struggled on and off in being in this kind of higher realm self. Can I ask what the book was? Way of the Peaceful Warrior by Dan Millman. That was a catalyst of me believing that there was something bigger than our physical meat suits. And for me, Alchemist, the Alchemist. Yeah, yeah Paolo. Because in England, in England, I never felt that uh, we could definitely, I felt that I could definitely not talk about this with anybody. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I actually sort of like, I don't know, something opened up in me and something was like, all those little nuggets that you feel that you kind of wonder if are true, like yeah. the feeling you have was suddenly put down on paper and explained and or just in a very simplistic, beautiful And it's romantic. true. I think we do have to question everything we read because you know we're living in a feeling universe, right. not a theoretical universe. It's really cool. Like when you learn meditation, one of the things and for anybody who's ever done uh, TM, which is how I learned my meditation, there was always something that, always, that stuck with me. And they always explain to you that meditation is like being in a ocean. We're in a world of an ocean where there's lots of loud waves crashing on top. But when you start to settle, when you go down to the base of the ocean, it's always calm. Meditation is that quiet place where when you calm everything and relax everything, that's when your creativity sparks. It's, not, it's no longer asking, it's like changing that mindset being like, may I not ask for a lighter load in life, may I ask for stronger shoulders, right? right. So like when you switch that intention, you're like, no, I don't want it to be easier, just make me stronger. We never are grateful for what is little that's left on our plate. And gratitude, being in the attitude of gratitude is really what's going to continually bring more stuff. And celebrating someone else's success, so important in this industry. Right. Being happy, genuinely like, wow. Because I feel that when you see someone else's success, that's the universe reminding you, that's what you want. So I'm gonna put this in front of you to test you. Are you gonna come at it at a point of envy? Or are you gonna come at a point of inspiration? Right. You know what I mean? Like, wow, that person achieved that. I would like to achieve that. Instead of being like, that fucker gets everything that they want. You know what I mean? And I think it's such an important way for anyone in the industry, especially the young people, to, to always have optimism, always believe that everything is designed exactly the way it is, that there is no bad days. There are just days of learning. And there's harder days of learning, and there's softer days of learning. You know what I mean? Some days you just get beaten down because you're like, wow, I really had to go through that today, I guess. And offering no resistance. Well, I think you've definitely gone through the learning. Yeah, totally. <laughs> no, because it'll never end. So you're one of the most positive vibe people I know in this industry. Were you able to be this positive your whole way through? And often I know that I'm being brought on a set, especially trips, I get a lot of trips. And my agent has said this to me before. She goes, you are not being invited on these trips all the time when, because you know how to wield a blow dryer better than anyone else, it's because of the energy you're bringing. Right. It's constantly what we hear. It's like, we need someone chill on the set for three days. Of course. Who's not gonna like drive us nuts, who can do <laughs> a good job, you know what I mean? Yeah. And like, that's it. So often I get these trips with advertising clients, a lot of these girls are just like, 
the advertisers love me. They're like, he's great, let's have this guy. Would you agree that the reason that you have succeeded for as long as you have is equal measured because of your talent, but also because of the way you, the way you approach I have no other way of explaining it other than that. Knowing who you are, the core of who you are, will inevitably be the most important thing you will ever carry till the day you die. Um, and that being your highest and best self, not your shittiest self, not your self that's jealous, angry, bitter, uh, any of those things, but your highest self where you're giving, you're compassionate, you're loving, you're, you're a team player, you wanna contribute to your day. I think that is what will bring you longevity in this career. I think that is, because it is truly the, we see less of that than we see the other. Right. So people tend to stand out when they're like that because we are in such a competitive industry yeah. where people just want to make sure they're seen for being great. And that's the most important thing. Like, I have a great skill set and watch me unfold here. Um, but I just think that if you put equal value to everything you're doing, chances are you're probably going to live a longer existence in this industry. Thanks for watching and if you want to see more face-to-face -face interviews then you can click here or here or subscribe somewhere around here.